we show those uh, gospel stories from time to time. Some of you may remember different ones we've shown. Uh, some of them have been about marriages restored that were on the brink of uh, disintegration or recovery from addiction and, and other things. And I, what I like about Jen's story, by the way, Jen grew up in our church. She and her husband Bob attend the worship cafe on most Sundays. And I like about her story is, you know, on the outside, you know, it doesn't look like that. She should have many problems. Beautiful family, lots of talent, living the suburban dream. But on the inside, she's as broken as any, any of us. And the gospel's for her too. I hope that encourages you. And I don't know if you caught this question she asked when she, at the beginning of her story. She said, uh, I was driving in my car and I asked God, is this it? Is this all there is? Is this, is this all there is to the Christian life, to my suburban faith? Is this it, God? I think that's a very familiar question to many of us. I recall a man who asked to meet with me. I, had, I knew him uh, casually, but we went out for coffee and he asked a very similar question. He put it a little differently. He basically said, there's got to be more than this. To, to being religious, to being a Christian. There's got to be more than what I'm currently experiencing. And I think m most of us have asked some form of those questions at one time or another, in one way or another, in our lives. I know lots of people who go to church. They, they worship, sing songs. They may give and serve on occasion. But they are not experiencing the overflowing joy that Jen referred to. And that David writes about in Psalm 51, verse 12, when he says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. We're in a series called um, You Were Made for This. It's a series about worship. What does it really mean to worship? And how do we worship? And what does that mean for us in our lives? We've looked at Psalm 51 a couple weeks ago uh, in terms of confession as a gateway to worship. David's great confession psalm. I want to look at another part of Psalm 51 we didn't really get to a few weeks ago, a different aspect of worship, not worship as confession, but worship as offering. Most people, when you hear the term worship, they think of what? Music and singing, right? What do you think of when you hear the term offering? Money, giving. But there's so much more to this, to worship as offering, and it's key, I think, to the more that we all want to experience from God, even if we don't say it. We all want more from God. And the principle which we're going to unpack from Psalm 51 is this. If you want mo to experience more of God in your life, then you must give him more of yourself. If you want more, if you've ever asked that question, is this it? Is there more to this? The key is to offer God more of yourself. Let's go to Psalm 51, verses 10 through 17. That'll be our text this morning. This will be familiar to many of you. Psalm 51, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation. And my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. This is the second half, if you will, of David's great confession psalm. He is moving from his confession of his sin, God forgive me, to God restore me, and to this last part, to worship. Worship is offering. In verse 12, he's saying, God, bring back the joy. David has lost something or lost touch with something that he desperately wants to get back. And that is the joy he once experienced of knowing that God loved him. Now, it's true. If you know David's story, we're going to talk about David's story, at least in part this morning. But if you know David's story, he, he had some major sins he's confessing here. Adultery and murder are at the top of the list, but not all of it. And it's true that David lost the joy of his salvation because of his sin, Right? He sinned, therefore he lost touch with, he grew distant from God, lost the joy of his salvation. I think it's equally true that David sinned because he lost the joy of God's salvation. You see the difference? He lost touch with God's joy because of his sin, but he also sinned because he lost touch with God's joy. He drifted, in other words. There was a time in David's life when he was just caught up in this sort of cycle of blessing, in, in God's favor and blessing on his life, he was tuned into the heart of God, obedient to the will of God, and experiencing the joy of God over and over again. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, 
This is early on in his days as a king of Israel. We read, And David became greater and greater, for the Lord of hosts was with him. Greater and greater in the eyes of, of other nations and of his own people. In 2 Samuel 7, verse 18, David prays, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? So he's becoming greater, but he's staying humble, acknowledging that it's all from God. In verse 22, you are great, O Lord God, for there is no one like you, and there is no God besides you. Giving God all the credit, becoming great, great success, great victory. In 2 Samuel chapter 8, it's all about David's victories and successes as king doing God's will. From 2 Samuel 5 to 2 Samuel 9, David is a man on a serious spiritual roll. He just can't do anything wrong, it seems like. He's seeking God's will. He's doing God's work. And God is blessing him. And he's just, it just goes from, from better. It just gets better and better and better. And then when you think about what happened to him in 2 Samuel 11, if you don't know that story, story of David and Bathsheba, go home and read it uh, this afternoon. It'll, it'll be better than watching any Lifetime television special. I guarantee you that. David plunges from the height of spiritual blessedness with God to the pit of sin and shame. He willingly and knowingly trades the treasure of God's good pl- blessing in his life for a night of pleasure with a woman he doesn't even know. He trades a fortune for a shiny nickel. This has to be one of the greatest spiritual swan dives in all history. David allows what should have been just a momentary distraction, if anything, to become a major moral crossroads and eventually failure in his life. Why? How does that happen? To a man who's at such spiritual heights, how does a, a psalm writing, giant killing, nation leading, battle winning king, man after God's own heart, throw it all away like that, fall so far and so fast? The answer is that David did not wake up one morning and decide, today I'm throwing it away. Today I'm cashing it in, I'm blowing up my life. It happens much more subtly for us and for David than that. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, the beginning of the story. We'll just read this verse only from the story. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It seems like an innocent enough verse, but there's a lot in there if we're paying attention. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go off to battle, what is David? King of Israel. David stays behind. It's subtle, but I think it's telling us David should not even be there. He's in the wrong place spiritually, and he's in the wrong place physically. Literally, he shouldn't be there. Early in his kingship, he always seeks God's counsel. He wants to know God's will. He's on the front lines with his God's God's army, fighting God's battles. I think this is telling us that David got a little comfortable in his role as king, in his relationship with God even complacent. But now the successes of his life, they seem to come a little easier. He, maybe he starts to believe the lie that, he's, that it's, he's the one that's accomplished all this. A little less praying, a little less fasting, a little less thinking about God or his will. He begins to drift. See, David doesn't wake up that morning and decide, today, hmm, what should I do? I know, adultery and murder. Haven't tried that before. Let's see how that goes. That's not how it happens for David or for us. It's a slow, gradual slide. He drifted from God long before he committed the sin. You know in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus says, uh, you have heard it said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you the truth, if a man looks at a woman lustfully, he's already done the deed in his heart, right? What's he saying? It happens in our hearts long before it happens on the outside in our lives. David has been drifting from God long before the great sin. And This kind of drifting from God does not always end up in a catastrophic moral failure. Sometimes it does for David. Sometimes it makes the headlines or blows up your life. But for many of us, what it leads to is just a cold distance from God, a joyless faith where we end up asking, is this all there is? Is this it? I don't feel very close to God. So that's David's condition. And again, we could go into detail about that, but that's his condition. What's the cure? It's right there in verses 16 and 17 of Psalm 51. Follow again as I read it. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. 
What does David offer? What does he do to make up? What does he do to get it back, to restore? He says it's not the sacrifices. It's not the religious acts in and of themselves. It's something else. David's actually echoing the words of 1 Samuel 15, verse 22, when the prophet Samuel says, What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings or your obedience to his voice? It's a simple question, but a profound one. Here's the question for you this morning. What does God want from you? If you, if, you, if you claim to be a Christian and a Christ follower this morning, which I know many of you do, and I do, what does he want from us? What does God want from you above all else? Verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. The Hebrew word for broken here is the word shabar. It literally means to shatter into pieces, to smash. It's the same word used, you know, in Luke 15, when the story, Jesus tells the story of the prodigal son who asked for his inheritance from the father and basically says, I wish you were dead now. Give me what's coming to me. And the, and the father does, and he runs away and, and blows all the money. In Hebrew culture, to do that was to wish your father dead. The father in that culture would have performed a ceremony called a kazah. He would have taken a pot and stood at the edge of the family property and smashed it, shabar, smash on the ground into pieces, saying, our relationship is smashed. It can't be repaired. It's broken into pieces. That would have been the symbol of the broken relationship. That's the word David uses here, smashed, broken, shattered. And contrite, the Hebrew word there is daka. It means to crush or to flatten. So David is telling us what God wants from you. What does God want from you? He wants your crushed, shattered, broken, flattened lives. Is that what God wants? Yes, that is what God wants from you. He wants your brokenness. And this is radically countercultural in our lives, right? It's counterintuitive in our hearts, and it's countercultural. When I was a kid, my mom made us dress up to go to church. I can see that some of your moms are the same way. Some of you, others of you, not so much, right? We dress up to go to church, right? We got to put on our best for God. But what she really means mostly is we got to put our best for the people sitting down the road from us, right? So I don't think God is concerned with the quality of our jeans or our slacks or whatever else we have on, right? So we dress up to go to church. We, we dress up for a job interview. My guess is you don't roll out of bed and not brush your teeth and just go and see if you get the job. You put on your best, right? You, you want to put your best foot forward in a college application, in an interview. When people come over to your house, do you mess it up? No, you clean it up. It was crazy at my house, right? We vacuum every nook and cranny. I guarantee they're not looking there, Mom. Right? We've got to clean everything. And in human interactions, it's not necessarily wrong to put your best forward. That's a good thing. But when it comes to a holy God, the Lord of heaven and earth, the Lord of all creation, the Holy One, what are you possibly going to put on or offer that's going to impress Him? Nothing. It's ridiculous when you think about it. Who are we kidding? That we could impress him with how we look, how we talk, what we do. The classic New Testament teaching on this truth is in a story Jesus told in Luke 18. We won't go into it in detail, but in brief, Jesus tells a little parable about two guys go up to the temple. Uh, one of them is a Pharisee. He's a respected, religious, rule follower, upstanding member of the community in that, in that Jewish community. The other one's a tax collector, a known cheat, a traitor to his own people. Both men go to the temple. Both men go to the temple to pray. And the, both prayers are recorded. The Pharisee's prayer is, thank God I'm, I'm a righteous man, not like these sinners, especially this tax collector. The tax collector's prayer is, O oh Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus says that's the man who goes home justified in the sight of God. Not the one on the outside you'd think. Why? Because of his heart. It's because of their hearts the same issue in Genesis 4, when God accepts Abel's sacrifice, but he rejects Cain's. Now, we can haggle about the, what was wrong with the actual sacrifice, but the point is, it came from the wrong heart. Here's the spiritual principle. God is not interested in the sacrifice so much as the heart from which it comes. Now, we don't offer sacrifices. Christ is a sacrifice sufficient for all. We don't come to the temple and offer burnt offerings. Christ is our offering. But we have religious rituals just the same, don't we? You come here and you, one of them you're doing right now. You, you, you look knowingly and, and pay attention to the pastor. That's something you do in church, right? You stand, you sit, you come to the table, you put the money in the plate, you feel good about yourself. We do go through religious motions. You can do everything right. And God will tell you, 
he is telling us that if it isn't coming from a broken and contrite heart, it's not only not pleasing, it's offensive. Who are you fooling? Like my uncle used to say, putting perfume on a pig. Never understood what that was or why you would ever do that. You cannot, offering God your religious duty from a heart that's not surrendered is an offense to him. You're fooling no one but yourself. The only acceptable heart in God's sight is the broken heart, the contrite heart. An object which has been broken has given in, has surrendered to the power greater than itself, right? Metal, a a piece of raw metal in a blacksmith shop succumbs, surrenders to the heat and to the hammer, and over time it's forged, it's transformed into something useful, even beautiful. It's the same principle with us spiritually. A broken and contrite heart is a heart yielded to the will and the love of God, and over time sometimes with heat and hammering, we are transformed into something useful, even beautiful for God. This is what God wants. You want to know what God wants with you? From you, he wants your broken heart. He wants broken people to offer themselves in their brokenness to him. The truth is that broken people are the only kind of people God can work with. Proud people have to be broken first. James chapter 4, verse 6. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. What does God want with you? Your brokenness. This is what David is getting at in verse 8 of chapter 51. He says, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have broken rejoice. The Hebrew word for rejoice here literally means to jump much. To dance, to leap for joy. Same word in in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 6 when David dances in his linen ephod, that's a Hebrew word for underwear, before the ark of God. Dancing, leaping with joy, jump much. Let the crushed life become a life that dances and leaps for joy. God loves broken people. Do you know that? It's the only kind of people he can work with. God loves broken people. He loves putting broken people back together. What I want to do um, is read through a list of statements about proud people and broken people. There's 20 so statements. And as I read these, I would like to invite you where you sit. They'll be on the screens or you can just listen to my voice. I'd like to invite you to do a little self-examination, a little spiritual inventory of your own heart. See which phrase describes you. And maybe even right here this morning, God will begin to break you of your pride. You ready? Proud people are self-conscious. Broken people are not concerned with self at all. Proud people focus on the failures of others. Broken people are overwhelmed with a sense of their own spiritual need. Proud people desire to promote themselves. Broken people desire to promote others. Proud people have a critical, fault-finding spirit. They look at everyone else's faults with a microscope, but their own with a telescope. Broken people are compassionate. They can forgive much because they know how much they have been forgiven. Proud people have an independent, self-sufficient spirit. Broken people have a dependent spirit. They, They recognize their need for others. Proud people have to prove that they are right. Broken people are willing to yield the right to be right. Proud people are self-protective of their time, their rights, and their reputation. Broken people are self-denying. Proud people desire to be served. Broken people are motivated to serve others. Proud people have a drive to be recognized and appreciated. Broken people have a sense of their own unworthiness. They are thrilled that God would use them at all. Proud people are wounded when others are promoted and they are overlooked. Broken people are eager for others to get the credit. They rejoice when others are lifted up. Proud people feel confident in how much they know. Broken people are humbled by how very much they have to learn. 
Proud people keep others at arm's length. Broken people are willing to risk getting close to others to take risks of loving intimately. Proud people are quick to blame others. Broken people accept personal responsibility and can see when they are wrong in the situation. Proud people are unapproachable or defensive when criticized. Broken people receive criticism with a humble and open spirit. Proud people are concerned with being respectable and with what others think. Broken people are concerned with being real and with what God thinks. Proud people find it difficult to share their spiritual need with others. Broken people are willing to be open and transparent with others as God directs. Proud people want to be sure no one finds out when they've sinned. Their instinct is to cover up. Broken people, once broken, don't care who knows or who finds out. They are willing to be exposed because they have nothing to lose. Proud people tend to deal in generalities when confessing sin. Broken people are able to acknowledge specifics when confessing their sin. Proud people are concerned about the consequences of their sin. Broken people are grieved over the cause and the root of their sin. Proud people compare themselves with others and feel worthy of honor. Broken people compare themselves to the holiness of God and feel a desperate need for his mercy. Proud people don't think they need revival, but they're sure everybody else does. Broken people continually sense their need for a fresh encounter with God and a fresh filling of his Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know which one describes you or which ones. I know which ones pierce me. If you want more of God in your life, then you must offer him more of yourself and not just the cleaned up presentable parts. Not just the parts that, are, that look good. Not just your strengths and your successes. You must offer him your weakness, your failures, your sorrows, and your brokenness. Do you know that we only have one thing we can offer to God which he has not already given us? Your talent, your treasure, your job, your friends, your home, all that, are, God gave you those. What's the one thing we can give to God which he has not first given us? It's our sin. It's our weakness and brokenness. We offer it back to him. Why? Because God loves broken people. He loves restoring broken people, putting them back together so that he gets the credit and the glory. Will you stand with me for closing prayer? And if you're here this morning and after I pray and we dismiss you, you'd like someone to pray with you personally, feel free to come forward at the close of the service. We'd love to meet with you down front. And also, I forgot to mention this earlier, but we, we take a benevolent offering once a month for those people in our church and in our broader community who are in, in, in need, material need. And if you, if, if you came prepared to give, ushers will receive that as you leave. Let's pray. God, we thank and praise you that, that your grace is, is not just for the strong and the sleek, and the talented. Your grace is for the broken. And though we don't like to admit it, and we try to deny it and hide it, we are all broken people. And thank you, God, that you love broken people, that you love restoring and healing and mending broken people. Oh, God, help us to be broken before you and contrite before you so that the world would see how good and merciful and gracious you are. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen, and go in peace.